let's see some examples from from uh, the U.S. now. So we talked about some general examples. I saw a couple from the U.S., but it was really more just sort of a big survey. Let's look at what we're doing here in the United States of America. So we have a marine protected area network, uh, formerly referred to as such. Here's the history of uh, our effort at uh, marine protected areas. So um, the first, our first national park, you guys should all know the date, 1872, Yellowstone. That was obviously a terrestrial version. This was not just our first national park, right? The first national park in the world. Thank you, right, first one ever, so very cool. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is, this slide is, is, is before the, the current administration is attempting to reduce the amount of protection. So this is, this is as of, we'll call this summer summer of, of 2017. But so as of, as of this summer, our, our um, national park system, which is primarily terrestrial but includes marine stuff, but our national park system had 391 units, including, right, Santa Monica National Recreation Area. We, our campus is within a national park, Merry Christmas. Um, about 33.8 million hectares, so large area, right? Pretty. Uh, pretty amazing, mostly in the western U.S., but still, nevertheless, still, still amazing. Our first um, uh, federal bird refuge, which was started by, who, kno who knows? Who? No. It's federal here, not, not, not NGO. No, he's dead by then. Teddy Roosevelt, thank you, good answer. I didn't hear you. Did you Steve say Teddy Roosevelt? Just said Teddy. I didn't hear. Oh, just Teddy. I see. I see. I should have been listening for the full Teddy Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt. So uh, this is uh, Pelican Island. This is important because this was established not for people. This was established for this, this organism, right, so that they could help recover. That was the, the sole motivation, so that this, this uh, critter that was relatively rare could could grow that's an important distinction that was the first nut in what became this huge expansive universe of our national wildlife refuge system which as of this summer is five it consists of 548 units and is uh, larger in size than our national park uh, system in terms of acreage right a lot of people don't understand that <clears throat> okay Flash forward to 1972, we have the Marine Protection Research and Sanctuaries Act. That created the National Marine Sanctuaries Program within NOAA. The charge of the National Marine Sanctuaries Program was to protect areas of special national significance due to their resource or human use values. And, uh, and, and they could protect something because of conservation, recreational, ecological, historical, research, educational, or aesthetic value, uh, and, and that could be added to the so-called sanctuary network. Um, now, that's, that, that's, you might think that's, that's great in the sense that, oh my gosh, could, archaeologists could be benefited, the, the poor widow animals could be benefited, the fishermen could be benefited, everybody could be benefited, right? Can't hear you guys. Too much Halloween candy in your mouth? <laughs> right, right. So it's great in the sense that it's very inclusive, and we're sort of walking into the meeting with open arms, but the problem is there's a thousand million people in that meeting. And so making progress is a lot harder than if we had a single charge. So if this just said, <coughs> we're going to preserve recreational areas, that's a lot easier thing to create rules to do, to create enforcement, what have you. Um, okay, so as of this summer, uh, the, the uh, National Marine Sanctuaries Program has three different, excuse me, 13 different units plus two additional things that it manages um, for a total of 155 million hectares. Compare that to our national parks, compare that to our national wildlife refuges, right? Or is a magnitude more two-dimensional surface of the earth covered? 
to say nothing of the volumetric protection if we were to add in the, the uh, you know, volume of the ocean that is protected. And then uh, I just give you a sense uh, for scale. California is 42.4 million hectares, right? So we're, we're more than three times California in terms of area in our National Marine Sanctuaries program. So a pretty amazing thing. Uh, this is the, it's, you know, I keep bugging these guys. I call them every year. Hey, can I get a new map for you guys? What do we want a map for? I want a map to show everybody. Uh, what is, uh, is this thing on Google Earth? No, I don't want a thing on Google Earth. Can you guys make a map? For whatever reason, they do not like to produce maps of the whole network. So that's what, that's what is, uh, is here. So I said, I said uh, National Marine Sanctuaries, but I said there's plus two additional things. Those are, those are symbolized for you with the triangles. Those are uh, National Marine Monuments, similar to, to how we have different categories of protection in the National Park System, but they're all considered units of the park, same thing. Um, right, all of, the, all of the circles are uh, National Marine Sanctuaries. Uh, so Finn's question is, are the triangle areas managed the same way as the uh, circles? And the answer is generally, although monument, monuments can be created by presidential fiat, which is how these are created. So I just have you note that, the, that our, our, our current administration is working to try to undo that. It's unclear if they legally can, but, but while they might be at least in the interim managed they don't, they, they, it's yet to be seen if they have the same level of protection. It's yet to be seen if our current administration can reverse some of those protections, either by completely eliminating or perhaps by shrinking in extent. Uh, so that's, it, it, that's a bit of a to be determined, but operationally, generally speaking, yeah. Generally, the triangles are new, well, they are newer than most of the other ones. And so, so anytime we establish a new protected area, it takes a while to figure out how to enact them. I think the thought is just like with our uh, national monuments on land, that, that that's the first level and that later on they would become, say, a formal park or green sanctuary designated. Um, th that's the tradition. Whether we've left that tradition behind or not is to be seen, but, but generally speaking, similar. As I mentioned before, we have uh, lots of different uh, competing goals. So, uh, well, they need, need not necessarily be competing goals, but sometimes they act in effect as if they're competing. So resource protection, scientific research. You and I want to go in and sample the fish? Nope, can't, need a permit. Wait, what? I'm a scientist. Nope, can't. I want to go out there and, and, uh, and go take my sixth grade class out there. Wait, nope, need a permit. Right? So, so these things need not necessarily be, be um, conflicting, but in practice, they sometimes amount to that. I want to draw your attention to the fourth bullet, which we've not talked about the Coastal uh, Zone Management Act yet, but that's a key part of that discussion. Suffice it to say, one of the missions, multiple use. What's, what's on land, what do we call the land of many uses? Forest service land, right? So this is, this is more of a forest service land type of goal than a national park type of goal, right? Not to say one is better than the other, but realize it's much more complex to manage multiple uses than to manage one or a limited number of users. Yeah, make sense? <clears throat> okay, let's talk a bit about Big Ocean. I, we touched on this before. Big Ocean, as I said, is that consortium of so-called uh, LS, MPAs, large scale marine protected areas, that really act as a different, a different thing than our, 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 our more traditional smaller size, because they are so large. Logistically, how do you police an area that's hundreds of thousands of hectares in size? You can't, at least you can't with the normal means. Are you gonna use drones? Are you gonna use satellites? How are you gonna, you know, so it's, it's so there, there are many reasons why these 
ex extremely large scale marine protected areas need different types of planning, need different types of bureaucracies than, than our, our, our smaller scale, more human scale areas. This is, this is the, these are the sites as they existed in 2011. And then I went to a m meeting and, well, anyway, it doesn't matter. So, so, um, th this, was, these, so this was the situation in 2011. This is the proposed site. So, so candidate, potential candidate for listing. People are thinking about doing it. Maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't. So can we use this, this network of large scale marine protected areas across the planet to help, to, you know, to help us figure out what we should or shouldn't do, et cetera. This is the sites. These are the sites as they stand in 2014. So notice they're growing, which that looks good, right? Right? More area, more protected, more fishies, coral. That sounds good, right? Oh, I thought I had another slide. <clears throat> Have a look. On here, you'll see things like Pippa. You'll see things like the Cook Islands. So Again, this is this is a, a collaborative, voluntary group. They're not a management group. They're, they don't have any special, special enforcement authority, whatever. So, the more people, the merrier in their group, right? I would just suggest to you that all of that stuff that's red is not necessarily uh, equally protected. I think it's fair to say there's some areas that are much more stronger uh, enforced and protected. Okay, we'll finish up by talking about what's going on here in California. This is before the so-called Marine Life Protection Act, which we'll talk about in a second. This is the story that, that, uh, that a little bit you guys have already heard. Uh, 1909 and 1913, you guys heard a little bit about this when we talked about Catalina. We had some what we would now consider marine protected areas established, they were all quickly deleted because the fishermen were like, no man, we want to fish here. So they were yanked back. Starting in, the, starting in the wake of World War II, we began to establish, mostly very small, but still we began to establish um, different areas that touched on estuarine or open ocean areas that we would now consider marine protected areas. They didn't use that term, but, but what we now call that. There were 17 different variants. Some of them you couldn't collect snails, but you could fish your heart's content. Some of them you could take lobster, but not, not um, you know, fish and, and, and all, the, all these different complex things. In total, that system put less than 1% of state waters into some form of of protected status. Then we have, and then in the background, we have the Georges Banks collapse, the cod collapse that we've, we've talked about on the East Coast that freaked everybody out. This fishery that lasted for thousands of years, we killed in, over the course of a couple decades. We here saw the elimination of abalone fishing because we saw a total collapse in the last little bit of our abalone fishing. And so we enact the ban that has been in place ever since. So I'm, I'm waiting to hear back from these guys. They're not calling me back. I have to give them another call. But hopefully we're going to go to an ab, the ab, what's called the Abalone Farm. It's a very, you know, inventive name, but the Abalone Farm uh, on, our, on our Central Coast trip. And so you guys get to see some current um, commercial production of abalone. But this is referring to wild caught abalone out in the waters. As I told you before, I used, for graduate school and stuff, we used to eat abalone. Now, it's illegal to harvest abalone of any kind south of San Francisco. And north of San Francisco, only recreational fishing is allowed and only on free, for free divers. So you remember Emily, Emily earlier in the semester talked about her dad getting smacked with a fine, right? Um, okay, so that's going on. Then in 1998, on the right uh, happens, which is um, we have this so-called International Year of the Ocean. And as part of that, we have um, a conference in Monterey. And on the left there is Al Gore. 
then Vice President of the United States. In the middle is uh, then President Clinton. And they're walking through the MPA that's part of the Marine, Stanford's Marine Station, called Hopkins Marine Station, in Monterey. So had graduate students walking them through and telling them about the value of this area that hasn't been uh, harvested and extracted. So there's a lot of momentum happening here, right? So momentum from stressful things, closure of fisheries, but also this idea of, hey, we can, we can manage things differently. Well, let's try this, this, this new sexy tool called marine protected areas out. As I said, in 1998, we had that, had that uh, National Ocean Conference. And then the Clinton administration issued the first in a long time so-called National Oceans Report, which had a bunch of recommendations, one of which was you know, use MPAs more widely as sort of a, a federal goal for the, for the whole of the US. A similar report comes out in 2001 that says, hey, MPAs still relatively untested, but they seem to be a pretty effective tool or potentially beneficial tool for boosting fish populations, et cetera. And then we have the big, big one, which is the Pew Ocean Commission report, which comes out in 2004 and is, is fully realized in the um, Obama administration um, that sets up some new things. And basically this report says we've been managing the ocean totally stupidly, totally disparate, all these different agencies, nobody has a clear mission. And this was an attempt to bring some rigor and some standardization to our management of our coastal marine resources. Okay. Leading up to 1999, because there's prints right there. Leading up to 1999, um, there's a lot of the, the underlying thing that's going on here in California. There's a lot of frustration with traditional fishing restrictions. Sometimes they work. They don't always work. Lots of evidence that our fish stocks off the California coast not doing super great. You have a lot of nerdy scientists and universities saying, hey, MPAs, we should do more MPAs. Let's do some more MPAs. Let's do some more MPAs. And we have the, the first tech bubble, which you guys probably don't remember. So this was a bunch of money, right? So the, story, the, the image I always have in my head is there's this TV commercial at the time, and there's this, uh, this overweight guy, and he's in this, in this, in this uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, cubby farm, and he's jumping, jumping up down going, IPO, 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 we're going to be rich, right? So the, 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 everybody was getting rich. Everybody's getting rich. And so what that translated into was a bunch of folks, especially in California, that had all of a sudden overnight a bunch of money. And so there was this huge flush of money in the NGO world, and people were saying, hey, we want to do something. I want to I have help. And so they would call the local universities, because they're mostly nerds, so they mostly came from universities. Hey, what should we do? And all these marine biology types like we should try MPA. So all this stuff led to this pressure to let's do something different with our protected areas off the coast of California. Let's do something nobody else has tried yet anywhere else in the world. So at the time, less than 3% of our state waters were in, were in any form of protect, protection. Most of the MPAs were very small, like Catalina, etc. Most lacked very clear objectives. And I said before, 17, Depends on how you look at it. You could be up as much as 30 different categories of MPAs. Very confusing. Confusing for me. Confusing for the rangers. So, so it was the bureaucracy was really thick. Hard to know what was allowed, what wasn't allowed, etc. Now, I sit here about 40. It was at least 30, but it, maybe as high as 40 or so. Okay, now we get to the so-called MLPA, the Marine Life Protection Act. What you need to know is it starts with us here in the Channel Islands, and we, we kind of screwed the pooch. So all this action is getting going, getting going, getting going. One of the big epicenters is, is right here in Southern California. Let's try these, these marine protected areas. And one of the thoughts is, hey, let's do them off the Channel Islands. Channel Islands are really important. You guys know that. We have a research station out there, all kinds of wonderful things going on there. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Let's, let's, let's overhaul the, the restrictions on fishing, the, the protected areas off the Channel Islands. Okay, cool, let's do it. So we start on this process that is a massive problem. 
Um, now, the advocates for this will say it was great, but, but in terms of what it did from what you and I talk about, which is a planning and engagement process, it was really, really bad. So what literally happened was we go into meetings in Santa Barbara and other places, go into meetings, and the scientists would put down maps. Look, this is where we should put the where we, we should add new marine protected areas. In other words, where we should close off fishing. And these fishermen would come to the meetings, and they'd say, "Wait, that's the best place where I get my urchins, or that's the place where I get my most whatever." And the scientists would say, yeah, but, but we modeled it, and this is where we should do it. And then the fisherman said, yeah, but, but you're not hearing what I'm saying. This is where I get most of my revenue. And the scientists would say, yeah, but we modeled it. And it led to this massive, massive fight. Now, because the Channel Islands are, are mostly, there's a lot of federal presence out there with the National Park, et cetera, it was, it was a bit... There were some institutional reasons why they could why that went forward, and it did. So the new boundaries that was what you guys see whenever we put up a map of the Channel Islands now, those new boundaries went into effect, started going into effect in 2003. Took a few years for them to be finalized. There's a few other parts that had to be changed, but basically 2008 fully done. Huge distrust. I was at a meeting with some of your other fellow colleagues, we were, where was that? That was, that was 2013, I think, at a meeting in Oxnard. And we're, we're having a discussion. It's a room, so it's, it's, it's the five-year review. How well is the Marine, how well are the MPAs doing around Channel Islands? And generally speaking, they're working, uh, they're, they're, it's a complex story, but generally speaking, they seem to be working um, fairly well on average. Um, but in the room, were a bunch of fishermen and a bunch of scientists. And the attitude was so caustic, it was so bad, this one researcher from UCSB is showing some data, and he has, he's up on the front of the stage and he's showing these slides. And a fisherman sitting next to me towards the back raises his hand and he says, excuse me, was that 97 or 90? He, 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 the graphs weren't labeled well. And so he said, excuse me, is this this year or that year? And the guy giving a talk said, um, I'm sorry, what? And then up popped the, the um, manager, the, the, the moderator, I should say, of the presentation, I mean, of, of, of the session. And he said, sir, 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 we're gonna take questions at the end. And the fisherman said, no, no, I hear you. I'm just saying, was that 1997 or, and the guy said, sir, that's, uh, we'll take questions at the end. And the fisherman said, no, no, I'm just trying to figure out if that's, sir. Do I have to have you removed? And so then the guy stands up and lets fly, the fisherman stands up and lets fly this huge bunch of expletives and said, you effing bastards, right? This is all a scam. You don't want us to learn. You don't want us to see the data. This is all bleepity bleep. And then he stomps on out, right? Now to be sure that's, that's sort of an extreme example, although I saw that many times. But, but that is, that's sort of the state that was generated by this, right? And so that, that, that's been caustic for the collaboration between scientists and fishermen. It's, it's slowly getting better now, but that was really, really bad. Notice that this is starting, the planning is starting here. The Marine Life Protection Act, which is a state law, is passed in 1999 in the midst of all this stuff that's going on. So we used to call it California Department of Fish and Game. Now we're supposed to call it California Fish and Wildlife. So it's super confusing. Are we talking about the feds or the state? But anyway, um, so our, our state agency is charged with overhauling all of our MPAs. If they're good, we'll keep them. If they're bad, we'll chuck them and do new ones is the idea. Um, we put together a plan and we say, hey, let's do this. And the fishermen say, no way, man. No way. Really, really in a big part sparked by the Santa Barbara folks that were so distrustful of the science. They said, this is not real science. This is just a scam. They don't have proof that MPAs work. And more importantly, they don't, they don't care what we think. And so it, it essentially torpedoed that statewide process. 2002, we tried a second time. In this case, we start with so-called stakeholder working groups. So we have these different groups of people that represent the tourism folks and the fishermen and stuff. But there's no money provided. So it doesn't really go anywhere. 
try three happens in 2004, and this is this is the try that ends up ends up working. And so this sort of uses the same as the second try, but um, it's distinguished by these so-called blue ribbon panels, meaning you know experts. Blue ribbon panels, and importantly, they they did it by carving the state up into small chunks. So instead of trying to do it all at once, we're going to take these these uh, parts in time. Uh, the main ones, and we'll sh I'll show you real briefly how that worked, but the main ones are basically done by 2013. And uh, we end up spending a lot of money. And it, it's both that NGO money I talked about before merged with state money. And this is under the leader, this was really sparked by Governor Schwarzenegger, who really wanted to get this done. And so he, he helped find state money, et cetera. And to say, it's important to say it was an imperfect process. N not everybody was happy with the whole thing. In particular, sport fishermen in Southern California were not particularly happy with this. But it set up a process, right, to at least allow everybody to be heard. What you guys need to understand, whenever we talk about what, whatever management issue we're talking about, we can't, everybody can't always win. But what's really important is everybody has to feel that they've been heard and truly been heard. So I might be really upset if you go forward with this thing, if you didn't listen, if you didn't go my way, but at least, at least you kind of heard me. I generally speaking won't, torp it won't blow up the building, right? If, however, I feel that you don't, you didn't even take my, my comment seriously, so I don't have any role in this, so screw it, I'll blow this whole thing up, right? I'll vote for whoever, I'll, I'll, I'll do some active way to undermine this effort or whatever. So it's really, really important that everybody not just look like they're being heard, but truly be engaged, truly be engaged. And so that, that's what was tried. And, and the process evolved over time. Lots of distrust, lots of feeling that, that things were, you know, all kinds of rhetoric and, 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 and native tribes feeling that they weren't listened to. There's all kinds of issues. And any one of these could have, could have ripped us apart. But suffice it to say, um, it, it survived the process. Um, as I mentioned before, we bro broke it up into different chunks of the state. And we took the one with the least amount of people first. And we left Southern California to the last because we were the most problematic because of the history of the Channel Islands and because we had the most people. So it was an iterative process. It was an iterative process, several different rounds, three different rounds for each region. And uh, it started with gathering data and um, all kinds of different feedback from these different groups. You don't need to know about them, but suffice it to say, starts with some scoping, get some feedback, adjust, adjust, adjust. There's public participation throughout. And, and one of these tools that we invented that's now being used in a lot of different places around the world is called C-Sketch. So with the very first round, the first part of the state, people literally, we had a bunch of GIS nerds and they're in the room and all these people had maps on the walls and they would say, hey, Joe Blow Public that came in, where should we do our marine protected area? And everybody drew on crayons and stuff on the walls. And then the meeting ended at seven o'clock and everybody else went out to dinner and the nerds had to go hide out in the hotel room for all night and transcribe all those handwritten maps into, into a data layer, right? And then they had to like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, and get it all done by eight o'clock and print them up. And they'd sleep all day. <laughs> C-Sketch is a massive improvement. C-Sketch uses a Google Earth-like interface. Now they're merging with Esri to try to bring it into Esri. But the point is, very easy, intuitive. Anybody can do this. Instead of just a, a few dozen or a few hundred people at a meeting, you can now get thousands of people around the whole region that can't come to the meeting can give their input as to what they think the protected area boundaries, for example, should be and why that area should be protected. So wonderful advance, a great example of how technology can help the conversation. That's C-Sketch. And, um, and this is where we stand right now. So we're almost done here. So this is where we stand right now. So I'm showing you the different regions of the coast and then uh, uh, statewide on the bottom. And, he and here we are in the south coast, which is from Southern California, is basically, basically Point Conception South. And this is where we stand. If you look, the numbers are to the left. <clears throat> in 2013 is at the end of the process. I should say, because uh, we're almost out of time here, San Francisco Bay Area has not been included. So that's the one area of the state inside the bay 
that's not been included because they have a different planning process and it's complex reason why. But, but all the outer coasts has been protected. And here we go, 2013, what, what's our percent protection? 11.7%. So that's above our 10% target, yeah? Okay, don't go yet, almost done. Uh, uh, statewide, if we're talking about no take, we're less than 10%. Here are the categories. We have four different categories of protected area now, which sounds complex, but it's not the 17 or the 30 or the 40 we started with. Much simpler. State Marine uh, SMRs or State Marine Reserve, that's essentially the no-take. That's basically the no-take. Um, and uh, and, and the, the State Marine Conservation Areas that are purple are also uh, this is an example of what our South Coast now looks like. There you go. These are our state um, uh, marine protected areas. So when you have a look at it, if we look at close, we have some areas that have some relatively large areas, San Alejo, uh, Data Point, uh, Point Vincent. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, here's Point Doom, which has a couple big ones, but there's huge swaths of Malibu. All, almost all, essentially all of Ventura coastline, if we leave out the islands, uh, are without a, a protected area, right? So this has to do with the planning process and what we valued and where the trade-offs would, would come, et cetera. So all kinds of modeling in here, but then it was strongly modified by, by stakeholder input, et cetera, but that's where we are. So to finish up, I'll just say uh, the marine, uh, marine life protection uh, area process was costly. It took a decade, it took 10 years, it took a lot of people's time, you know, tens of millions of dollars. Um, ultimately, it was a better product than, than the first version. I think everybody would agree. But it need not have taken that long had we not had the poor distrust that was sown from the activities around the Channel Islands effort we could have done this in a, in a much more timely um, a fashion. We developed a lot of new, new technology, a lot of new modeling efforts, which are wonderful from a lot of our colleagues. Sea Sketch, that example I mentioned to you. And then one that I didn't mention on too much I needed to talk about real quick, environmental communication. When we started this and I would go to meetings, or, or you would go to meetings 10, 15 years ago, it was, well more like 15 years ago, it was me and some industry folks and some fishermen and the agency guy was trying to run it bad generally bad now almost all of the scientific advisory panels i sit on or all these different groups we have an environmental consulting firm running the show so what that means is we have an objective third party someone that that understands the issues understands the issues and their whole job is to facilitate. So they set up the meetings, they take the notes, but they make sure nobody gets, ah, oh, thanks, Dr. Anderson, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, appreciate that. You can, you can sit down now, you know, that kind of stuff. And they treat everybody the same, they try to, and they try to make sure everybody is heard. So that notion of environmental facilitation, environmental communication that's really effective facilitating has been really, really key. Uh, there's two engagements and trade-off, I'm just, just know that. Um, and then there are some afterthoughts. Don't go yet, look at this last bullet. Particularly monitoring. Mon does this work? We always leave that to the end. Everybody wants to give money to buy the wing for the museum. Nobody wants to pay for the janitor, right? That's not sexy. But that's incredibly important, especially in this context. Because, for example, the Channel Islands effort around Channel Islands was done so poorly. No, there's no real rigorous, well, that's not fair to say. There, there, there didn't be, we didn't begin with a rigorous monitoring and assessment. Statewide, $38 million. We have like $5 million every couple of years to split up over the whole state to monitor stuff. So a relatively small amount of money, not enough to do all the stuff. So the stuff that we're doing with our beach assessments, um, our other colleagues, those are, those are key things to assess how the conditions and health are evolving, but many of them are relying upon citizen science type of stuff as opposed to the state paying to see if its 
policies are effective or not. So we need to be careful always about the so-called afterthoughts. Um, and then, yeah, finally, I'll just, I'll just leave this up and you guys can take off, but I'll just say, uh, again, reiterating some of the stuff from last time, 10 to 30 percent, somewhere in there is, is a good target, uh, not knowing anything else. Um, uh, it's better if we can design these networks as a whole as opposed to doing them piecemeal and over time. Um, again, as we said before, if we have a well-managed species, we can get by with less, less area in the protected area. Um, and we usually establish reserves after we're already in a bad state, and so we're asking them to do miraculous things a lot of times that they maybe can't. Uh, our, our Marine Life Protection Area Act is a model for other regions, and people have been using that elsewhere now. Um, we have to include enforcement and monitoring, and continual monitoring, and also outreach and enforcement to inform people of what's going on with these things and, and what worked and what didn't work. Okay.